I don't know, am I in the shot? What about now? Am I in the shot now? That didn't go quite how I had hoped. Anyway, how do I charge mismatched batteries in my car without damaging the alternator? And that is what this device solves. Welcome back and thanks for being here. If you watched my lithium battery build, then I might have left you wondering a couple of things. First, how do I charge my lithium battery without overburdening the alternator? I've already had a couple of comments on that video. One of them is certain that I'm going to burn up my alternator. and I hope he's wrong. I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. And next, what happened? What did I do? I moved my charger. It was in here concealed under this panel and it was photogenic with the battery. And then when I shot my previous video through the hatch, I was able to capture my pretty face and the pretty charger and the pretty battery all in a single shot. And now I've gone and moved it and made it more functional. I'll explain that in a minute. So first I'll start off by saying, no, I don't have solar charging. I have a lot of really nutty stuff in this small car, but I'm not quite ready to be institutionalized just yet. I still like my stealth approach to things with the exception of when I have my HF antenna mounted. And yes, having the, having the charger out here in the open does make it less stealth, but when the refrigerator is here and the seat back is reclined to where it usually is, it's kind of hidden and I'll show you that. When it comes to charging lithium batteries or secondary batteries, most RVs have uh, a secondary alternator as well that's strictly for charging the house battery. Technically, this is a house battery, although this isn't really a house. A lot of vans, save for small van builds, they also have secondary alternators or it's not hard to add them, uh, but most don't. And I'm pretty certain that the vast majority of passenger cars also do not have secondary alternators. Comment below if you're aware of a passenger car that has a secondary alternator. It's got to be a luxurious, expensive car that's something I would never even think to drive. So when it comes to charging, there are three problems or challenges with charging a secondary battery without a secondary alternator. First, Odds are very good that the secondary battery has a different chemistry than the starter battery. Most OEM starter batteries are flooded wet cells, gel cells, or maybe even an AGM battery. And this car has an AGM battery, but I installed that when the car was three years old. Those battery types like to charge between 13.8 and 14.2 volts. Lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are very popular uh, for upgrades, uh, they're also known as LiPo batteries, and that's what I have under here. Uh, it's a very popular choice for a secondary battery, and they like the charge between 14.2 and 14.5 volts, depending on how the installer set it up. A single alternator cannot charge at two different voltages. It's, that's not what it's made for. The next challenge. A lithium battery will accept massive amounts of charge current. My setup, the BMS on it, will accept 120 amps in or out, and others will take 200 amps or even more. And that's more than enough to steal charge current from your starter battery or even burn up your alternator, which is what some people have expressed a concern about with my car. My alternator's output is 150 amps. Some OEM alternators output more and some less. Regardless, your automaker's engineers did not specify an alternator with the intention of it charging extra batteries. And they might not have even intended for it to, to charge the starter battery from deep states of discharge. So think about that. If you like to sit around discharging your battery, listening to the stereo, running your ham radios, your alternator might not even be up to that task. So anyway, we need a way to limit the charge current to safe levels for your alternator. And finally, we need to isolate the two batteries so that they don't feed off of each other when the engine is off. There are battery isolators on the market that can handle that task. A lot of RVs have them and some off-road vehicles have them as well. But it's nice to have a charger like this one that handles both tasks. This is the Orion TR 12 slash 12 dash 30 360 watt DC to DC charger by Victron Energy. It accomplishes all three of the tasks that I just shared with you. It accepts 
whatever alternator voltage makes it to the rear of my car through 14 feet of 4 gauge wire in my case, adjust that voltage to 14.2 volts that I want for charging my lithium battery and limits the charge current to 30 amps, often less. It runs through all phases of battery charging, starting with bulk where it sends max power to charge the battery, absorption where current is reduced gradually, and then float where the battery is maintained with an occasional trickle charge. The charger automatically detects when the engine is off, stops charging, and then isolates the two batteries from one another. And then it resumes charging when the engine starts. My startup sequence takes about 15 seconds because of the extra stuff that I have in the back. Uh, five seconds from my relay when the uh, alternator starts outputting and it exceeds 12.7 volts. I've got a little device that turns on a relay which then turns on my equipment and then powers the charger. And then the charger needs uh, 10 seconds to uh, check things out and analyze things before turning on the voltage to go to the battery. And then the BMS takes a look at things and then it says, okay, I'm ready to charge now. So that takes about 15 seconds. Now the charger can be monitored by Victron's Bluetooth app. And it's cool to check out at first. I spent a lot of time watching it to learn how the charger runs through its different charging phases. But I found the BMS app to be more valuable since it reports the charge current and how much time I have left in the charge cycle or how much time I have left running on battery. Overburdening my alternator was a top concern when I was shopping, so I was pleased to see that the charger limits current at 30 amps. Now I've been sharing some pictures and you may notice that my charge current is usually between 21 and 27 amps, not 30 amps. And it's easy to think that maybe there's a problem since the unit is marketed as a uh, 30 amp charger. And I think I can explain. You see, it's probably more accurate to describe this as a 360 watt charger instead of a 30 amp charger. Mathematically, 360 watts divided by 12 volts is 30 amps, so that's the marketing. Well, I'm not charging at 12 volts. In my application, I'm charging at 14.2 volts, and 360 watts divided by 14.2 volts is just over 25 amps. So far, my alternator appears to tolerate the extra 25 amps fairly well. Should I find myself with an alternator that has failed prematurely, and how would I know if it's premature when the car has nearly 150,000 miles on it? But anyway, at that point, I might be able to fit a 180 amp alternator that's specified for the 2019 Golf R or the uh, Arteon. That's my replacement plan. That's not an upgrade plan, so I won't do that unless my alternator actually fails. Then there's also a heat consideration. The charger can output 100% power up to about 104 degrees. And that's, uh, I think that's the chassis temperature, not the air temperature. So if, if that's the chassis temp, then it's very easy to exceed that even now in December. According to the specifications, the charger's output diminishes about 3% for every 1.5-ish degrees. It's a centigrade thing. I'll put a, a translation up here, but I have seen this reach 110 degrees, at which point the charger is working at 90% capacity. And I reported earlier that 25 amps at 14.2 volts is pretty typical. So 90% of that is 22 and a half amps, which is consistent with what I've been seeing during my testing. Output is reduced by almost half by the time it gets to 130 degrees, and that's shortly before the, this power supply will shut down. And I don't think my charger will ever get that hot because I have forced ventilation here. My original installation was having a negative impact on heat. At first, I thought I was gonna take the unit and mount it with the fins down, the display up, and convenient wire routing, it would be pretty. But then the owner's manual, yes, some of us still read those things, it says that the unit must be mounted with the cooling fins oriented vertically and the power uh, connections downward. And I don't know if that's for, uh, if it's in a, a compartment that's not water tight, that way water will run down and I go into the unit. I'm not sure. Anyway, I still mounted it inside of here for some concealment and I knew that it was gonna be cramped for space and there might be a little bit of a cooling problem. And there was also a lot of cramping on the wires that I didn't like. 
It didn't take long for me to decide that I wanted to try it out here. The, the unit was charging, once it got hot, it would back off to about 19 amps, and I wanted to see if I could do better. I put it out here, uh, right on top of one of my cooling fans, and it, so it's still drawing air straight through, and I gained three amps at almost every point along my, uh, my charging journey, so this was a good move. Another leech for charging current, the electrical output to my equipment. It's between the lithium battery and the charger. So any power that my equipment is using is taking away from charging current that's reaching the battery. If my transceivers, Raspberry Pi, and dash cam are running, which they usually are, that's about two to three amps that's not going to the BMS to charge the lithium battery. And make that six amps if I've got my refrigerator in here and it's running. And then if I transmit, if I key up my, uh, my ham radio, that's 12 amps if I'm transmitting on VHF or UHF and 22 amps on HF. So that takes away from everything. I hope that makes sense. Something I didn't explain earlier, you may have noticed that I have three terminals down here instead of four. I chose a non-isolated version of this charger instead of an isolated model. Uh, the isolated models have four terminals down here. I had read that the isolated charger is best for RVs or boats that have fiberglass or non-conductive bodies that are not electrically tied to the chassis or starter battery's negative terminal. The isolated charger accepts a wire from both starter battery terminals and then provides a negative terminal or common ground for the secondary battery. Having a small car, I am able to ground everything to the chassis. I have a point back here in my electronics panel where all ground wires are tied together and then that point is tied to a seatbelt anchor with a 4 gauge wire and that anchor is welded to the unibody. And of course the negative terminal of the battery is tied to a point that is also welded to the unibody. So that arrangement has served me very well for five years. Another explanation for the isolated charger is that it eliminates noise between the separate charging systems and I can't speak for that. That's engineering stuff that I haven't looked into because I didn't feel I needed to. Comment below if you can explain that. I hope I've covered everything for you. Feel free to ask questions if you have them. See my lithium battery video if you want to know why I did this to my car. I don't want to explain it again. Take care. See you later.